Excuse me, Andrew, for a sec. Yep, yep. We're, we're back. And I just want to tell you, if those of you who are wondering about um, powering up your devices, if you've brought many devices with you, we do actually have a box full of, um, you know, uh, box, what do you call those things, multi-plugs and so on, in the green room where we're having our morning tea. So perhaps it's a bit late this afternoon, but if you need one tomorrow morning, or if you want to go on quickly plug in. Um, they're just under the table in there. So uh, after we finish this session, we will find out uh, about where to go for dinner, those of us registered for dinner. The other thing is that at the end of this session, could all today's speakers please come down for a lovely group photo. And now can I take the opportunity to introduce Andrew. Andrew's been a wonderful presenter at Aussie Way. He challenges most speakers and contributes a lot to Aussie Way each year. And this time, it's that little old attribute. It's just not good enough. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. It's good enough sometimes, not other times. <laughs> Thanks very much. I did a session a few years ago at Aussie Way about the alt attribute and alt text and all sorts of things. I'm taking it a bit further today. So what we're going to look at, we'll look at when the alt, alt text is effective and I'll then consider situations where text is not effective. Uh, screen readers at present do not read graphics. Um, people keep threatening that they will soon but that still hasn't happened and even if it does, uh, the access would certainly be nothing like the uh, the resolution that people get visually. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about some tactile graphics creation tools. Uh, and finally, when is online material insufficient and which graphics creation tools to use? So the purpose of alt text. To convey in words the same meaning conveyed by the image. Um, and the wording will include, uh, well, sorry, uh, the wording will um, depend on the purpose of the image. Uh, uh, and the surrounding text should therefore provide context for what you put in your alt text. Decorative images under WCAG are exempt from requiring uh, alt text. My own view is that some people, perhaps quite a few people, uh, have a very broad definition of decorative. Uh, they say, oh, well, that's purely eye candy. Um, screen reader users and other people with images turned off don't need to know about that. And I think that's often a misplaced concept. I get emails, uh, for example, from Microsoft and they'll have little, they'll have all text on their images saying a happy family sitting on the couch looking at their Microsoft Surface. And it's advertising, but, but it, sets, it sets some atmosphere and I, I quite enjoy that. If it was overdone, it could become a real pain in the neck. But, um, uh, yeah. Uh, it's worth keeping in mind that it is possible to meet the letter of WCAG 1.1 and provide nothing of any use. Some more text considerations, and I'm probably t teaching grandma to suck eggs here, but it's worth perhaps going over. All text should be written by the author, not by someone else. Uh, it's the author's responsibility, that's the first point, but also the author knows why that image was put there and therefore should have uh, the best knowledge about what sort of text should be written to describe that image. How long should all text be? Uh, my view is as long as necessary. Uh, people have argued about that, but uh, there is no upper limit. Uh, although, as I'll say a bit later, there are some options if it's going to get very long. The text shouldn't add to what's in the image. So, for example, it shouldn't say when the photo was taken or where it was taken and so forth. That should be dealt with in, in the surrounding text. Describe the scene rather than the image itself. So, for example, don't just say photo of the Prime Minister. 
I mean, what's he doing? You know, is he looking happy? Is he looking sad? Is he looking in the mirror to see who's creeping up behind him? You know, what's, what's, what's going on? Uh, um, um, you know, we, we want to know, you know, what's, what's happening in, in, in the, the photograph or the drawing or, or whatever it is. Uh, uh, for longer text, perfectly valid to link to a separate page. And that, that will often be quite a useful technique if, if it's a complex diagram, diagram for example. And just keep in mind that if you're putting or if you're looking for all text in Word documents or even if you're creating it, when you put the mouse over the image, you won't see the, the text come up like it does on HTML pages. So you have to go into the, the alt text dialog to, um, to find it. So varying, varying alt text effectiveness. It can be very effective, somewhat effective, mildly irritating, or very disruptive. <laughs> um, it, it may fail to convey important information or the important concept. That will depend on the material and or the skill of the author. It's important that all text should require the, or should get the same level of attention as the rest of the website. And when I go to some commercial sites and I see alt text, alt text, alt text, I know they haven't put a lot of thought into it. <laughs> so I'm about to show you an example of some alt text that I wrote. Uh, Feel free to quibble with the wording, but I think it does actually serve the purpose for what I had in mind. Uh, so I'm going to bring that up. Heading level one, my dog Miffy. This is a short story about my dog. Let's see what your knowledge of dogs is like. Heading level two, what breed of dog? By looking at her photo, do you know what breed of dog she is? Graphic smallish brown dog sitting on grass. Somewhat large ears are erect. Does the shape and size of her ears give you a clue? What about if I tell you the famous person in the next photo has this breed of dog? Graphic photo of Queen Elizabeth. Okay. okay. Um, so my own view is that that old text lets you answer the question if you have enough information about corgis and royal families, <laughs> um, which was the, the purpose of the exercise. Now, something of more dubious value. Uh, don't, don't put your hand up, just call out. Does anyone here know what Pascal's triangle is? We've got a couple of people, no one else? Yeah, another one. <laughs> uh, my own view is that Pascal had too much time on his hands, but... Uh, um, this is the alt text that I wrote for Pascal's triangle. Alt text for Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle starts with one at the apex. Below it there is one to the left and one to the right. Next there is one on the left, two below the apex and one to the right. Below that numbers are one, three, three and one. The sequence can extend indefinitely. Each number is the sum of the two numbers directly above it. For those of you who haven't seen Pascal's triangle before, do you now know what to expect when I bring up Pascal's triangle? What is it, a couple do, most, just yes or no? No, thank you. <laughs> so that's Pascal's triangle, <coughs> pardon me. This is a real example, it came up at work a few years ago and when a maths teacher sent me an email and said, what alt text do we put on this? <laughs> uh, well, well we, we had meetings at, at high levels uh, about what we should do with it. And I did a bit of research and found out there might be three or four blind students doing the extension for maths that year. Uh, we also decided that no amount of alt text was going to do the job. Just excuse me while I duck down for a second, I want to pick something up. Didn't actually run away. <laughs> so what about that? That's uh, 
I've got it around the right way, yes, that's good. <laughs> uh, and I presume up the back you can see it, but, uh, uh, and for those of you who can't see it, by all means come down and you can fondle it afterwards. Uh, this is using swell paper, so the, the, the characters are raised. Uh, so very quickly, looking at that uh, diagram, if you like, uh, someone who can't see the thing knows what Pascal's triangle is like. And if you want a Braille version, there's your Braille version. Very easy to, whoops, <laughs> to create and get the concept across very quickly. And that's, I think it's fair to say, that's a relatively simple example um, of, of a diagram that, that is hard to describe with all text. Oh, just making sure I wasn't missing anything. Okay, some options for producing tactile diagrams. Braille and Bossel with relevant software. Um, that requires sp specific skills both to create and, uh, uh, and to read them. <laughs> um, swell or capsule paper, which is what I just showed you, um, that's, that paper's been around for quite some time and you either photocopy or print the material onto the paper, put it through a machine that applies ultraviolet heat to it and all the black areas get raised up. Um, and it, it's a very nice option. Uh, that'll suit blind people, those with limited vision and some people with cognitive impairments as well. Raised line drawing tools such as the, uh, the APH Draftsman, that's like a little plastic sheet and you draw and, and, the, and the line gets raised up immediately. Many years ago when I was doing economics, an economic subject at, uh, at uni, my lecturer just used to take me over to his office after the lecture and just draw on, onto a thing like that and it was a very quick way of getting the material. That's the least expensive option and it's good when you're out and about but, uh, but you can't run off multiple copies like you can with swell paper or braille printers. Uh, last uh, Christmas, my daughter and I were doing some Christmas shopping and we came across a device which I was really impressed with and they said it was suitable for five and upwards so she bought it for me. Uh, uh, this is a pretty scruffy video uh, but I'll, uh, I'll let you give you, uh, I'll give you a quick demo of it. If I hit the right keys. Canada, Canada, Ottawa. Barbados, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Kingstown. The United States of America, Washington, D.C. So you're hearing our budgerigars in the background as well. <laughs> um, so what, what happens there is that when I touched any country with the, the pen, it told me what the country was and what the capital was. There are options for giving other information like um, the size of the country and all sorts of other information um, just by touching another panel. Um, uh, really, really nice device. I understand that some people are looking at putting raised lines onto that sort of thing and that would, that would you know, for someone who is blind would really make that a, a, a very exciting product indeed because at the moment I, I can't really get a, an idea of the shape of each country. Uh, there's many years ago, back in the 80s, mid 80s, a, a, a thing was developed in Australia called the Nomad where you had a raised line diagram which you put on a touch sensitive uh, panel and then when you pressed on certain parts of it the computer would tell you what was going on. Uh, I've been, uh, there's one in America now called IVO, but I don't think anyone brings it into this country, which is a real shame. But I've been doing a bit of playing with the swell paper. This computer I've got here has a touch screen, and if I put the swell paper on the touch screen, if I could secure it accurately, I could then do a similar thing. So that's really doing that sort of, getting that sort of technology, but at a much uh, cheaper option. So beyond tactile pictures, so picture that's in the opera house sales. My daughter who 
can't visualise anything, said that's a very discriminatory statement. <laughs> uh, so have a think about the uh, Sydney Opera House sales and see how you would write all text to describe them. Anyone got any ideas? So this, this was the old... So waves, yes, yeah. Yes, so that, yes, you run into another problem, don't you? Well, this is what I wrote. Heading level one, Sydney Opera House. Marvel at the sales of the world famous Sydney Opera House. Graphic, how on earth do I describe this? <laughs> now, just bear with me again while I'm, I'm not running away. So what about that? And for those who can't see it, again, grab me afterwards. Done on a 3D printer. That's the sales of the Sydney Opera House. Uh, makes a whole lot more sense than trying to describe it with text or even with a, uh, a raised line diagram. And there is huge potential for uh, 3D printers to provide uh, information and concepts to people who can't see uh, graphics. I'm just dropping back on the floor. So in conclusion, all text can be effective in many circumstances. Uh, it requires diligence and some expertise. Uh, the meaning of some complex images uh, can be difficult or impossible to convey in words. Therefore, online material should, under, under specific circumstances, include physical material. So particularly in an educational setting, which is where I work, there's little point producing screeds and screeds of alt text if it's not going to get the concept across. And I think that whether it's education or whether it's people producing basic math maps and so forth, or lots of other resources, people now have to start thinking about not just putting it up on the web and saying, well, that's my, that's my duty done. I think we have to start looking at providing physical resources to go with what's uh, what's online. And current hardware and software makes that a fairly easy thing to achieve. Um, so thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much. Um, i take the first question, Chance. Uh, I believe that when you're writing old text, you say you need to be um, know about how to do it, some expertise. Uh, some of that expertise is in describing the image and not interpreting the image, am I right? It depends. I mean, sometimes it'll be necessary to interpret the image. Um, that's where it gets very tricky um, uh, because, yeah. Uh, it, Depending on the context, Yes, guess, yeah, very much, yes, sense. yes. Uh, okay, so I've better questions from someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got a question somewhere there? There's a question I can see a bit of movement in the dark. There we are. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, I've been asked this of quite many times over the years, and I've asked a lot of different professionals, and I keep getting different answer. Like, it doesn't say exactly how long is the, um, like, inappropriate for the alt text to be, if it's too long, um, as, as opposed to making an alt text, um, you just have a high-level description with a link to uh, somewhere else on the same HTML page or an alternate page. But what is appropriate and what's too long? People have quarrelled about it. Some people have set it up a limit of 120 characters or something other. Uh, there's no real reason to do that. The, the difficulty, if, you, if, if it gets very long, is that it can be more difficult to read with a screen reader, particularly if the screen reader is not going to stop after every sentence, uh, which most do these days, but it can get a bit messy. Um, so if it's going to be fairly complicated, it really is better for your old text to say, um, you know, see description on this page or something like that and have a link to a, to a separate page. Uh, but, the, I mean, as concise is always good, uh, but there's no point being concise if you don't get your meaning across. 
Um, yeah, so, so I, I, I'm not going to give you a number. Because <laughs> um, uh, where, where I work, um, we've got a lot of very, very complex images and diagrams, and it's important that everything that's being conveyed visually is also in the alt text, which is a really big job, and I'm just glad, I, like you said, you sent it back to the author. But um, as, as I said, it would be great if I could get a definitive figure, <laughs> try and limit it to a paragraph, but would it be okay to make it more than a paragraph in your view? If, if it went beyond a paragraph, I'd be, I'd be thinking about linking to, a, to another page uh, because it, it just uh, gets, starts to get a bit unwieldy. Uh, so the alt text would be a very brief description and then below that have a link to, to another page. There is a, a facility in HTML which I'm fairly certain has been deprecated, someone might correct me, the, the long desk. Um, that makes it only available to screen readers anyway, which is not a good idea. Uh, most people don't know how to use it, <laughs> both authors and screen reader users, so that's not very helpful. Um, so it's better to have a link that everyone can see that just says uh, longer description or something like that. that that's not going to destroy someone's day who can see it, uh, but it's going to let someone go off and read it if they want to and then pop back to where they were. Okay, there's another question. Thanks for that, Andrew. Um, just on that, with um, descriptions, alt text, how, mu how, to, how much to describe, um, I came across one that, um, a description, I was in the Breast Cancer Network Australia site, and um, they said, woman lying down, scratching head. And that wasn't going to give me much information. But then they said, looking worried, and I went, oh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that makes sense now. Yeah. Yes. So if you can keep it as contextual, um, that still helps within yes. context. Yes. Uh, in terms of diagrams, um, if you can put it in a table, that can help. Um, and sometimes you can't, but where you can, it would be good. But if it was a if it was a graph, for example, you could certainly put that into into a table. Yeah. Uh, yes. And bear in mind that that's a good thing to do anyway. Mm. Um, because mm -hmm. some people do well with line graphs, others like to look at the figures. Uh, <laughs> when I was at uni, I wrote an, an essay and so, um, one of the lecturers marked it. He said, you use a lot of descriptive stats. And I said, well, yeah, there's a reason for that. And, yes. Where can I get those graphic, those um, diagrams that you had, those tactile? Uh, oh, yeah. I, 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 in Opera House, I have to tell you, those who didn't see it, is one we might compete for at some point. <laughs> my, my, my daughter did the Opera House. Uh, she's got access to a 3D printer. Uh, the swell paper, uh, my daughter and I did. I've got the machine at home for doing it, uh, really to uh, help with my interest in motorcycle racing <laughs> so I get maps of the circuits. <laughs> uh, Andrew, could we, people will play with those tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, really yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll leave them here. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But if I lose the Opera House, Fiona will kill me. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Uh, Carissa, where are you? You like to set up for a minute, Andrew. I'll just take his treasures away. I'll just yeah. pull the whole show down yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Andrew. It's not a question for you. Just in um, in addition to what Andrew suggested, alt text is not only for screen readers. It is also useful for people who turn off images when there is a low download uh, bandwidth or um, images are turned off in browsers. So most of the cases, when I turn off the browser images, I see the alt text is overlapping or truncated. So the amount of alt text width or like the length of alt text we put in should be considerate of how much the image size is as well. And also in most of the cases, I see there is a background color set on the image and the color of the alt text would be low contrast with the image or the background. So those are the other considerations we have to think about alt text when we design for it. Thank you. Thank you. While we're working that out, one of the things that I've always that I've wondered about for a little while actually is 
Um, our Office programs, I know that with PowerPoint and with Word, one of the things that Office 365 is doing now is um, providing, is it's adding its own alt text. How good is that alt text? I haven't looked at it enough, to be honest. Yeah, um, and how, how, how much can we rely on it? How much can we expect our content people will rely on it? I think these are going to be questions for, you know, for, um, uh, for the very near future. Do you say Charissa or Charissa? Charissa. 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 Charissa wide saying content um, but I'm focusing here on content that was meant to be published in print and then you put that online so um, mostly I'll be touching on PDFs and the presentation is not an argument whether it's worth having PDF on the web but it is for saying that when you have a PDF make sure it is accessible so let's continue Okay, um, my background, um, why I got interested in doing this. Um, my training is in industrial design and I've worked as a graphic designer, visual designer comms for the past 25 years, plus the five years I'm work, I've worked on digital accessibility. I just stumbled on it because it's a challenge for me. Um, I was doing graphic design and I'm, I'm sure I know what I'm doing, but I'm given a task to make something accessible. And I don't know what, means, what accessible means. So I tried my best just looking online and one person taught me a, a day, like saying, oh, did you do this, 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 this? But that was a version of um, InDesign that was really clunky before we got um, additional software. Um, um, like uh, functions that added into it. So I, I went to Vision Australia. I thought I'd take a shortcut. And I've approached them and say, can you train me? And we did work together to make one of the probably first um, InDesign jobs in Vision Australia accessible. And I've worked with some of the people, they're here. So that's why I've, I thought um, this is my community. I know probably half, probably a third of you. So yep. Um, going on, um, so the publications, um, if we say something we publish, it makes, it makes content accessible to the public, whether it's for print or for online. So that could be Word, PDF, and if um, the, the, that could be bulletins, fact sheets, reports. Okay. Well, being um, doing work on accessibility, I've realized there is an ecosystem. You are not by yourself. As a content creator, I write a bit of uh, the content that we create, but I work with subject matter experts. I'm a designer as well, so I put it together and I make it accessible. But that's not only my job. The job would be for me to work with the users as well, because I couldn't be doing this job without working with the user. So I have to understand what they do. I don't need to just look at the checklist, make sure Adobe Acrobat says, oh, it's okay, it's accessible. I need to sit down with someone and really observe them, how that works. As well as uh, my technology has to work. So the tools that I use have to be working. Sometimes it's really frustrating because the, those are the things that are out of your hand. You cannot make Adobe Acrobat work better than it can because they're, yeah, unless you can influence Adobe. And the standards, so you have to, we were doing this and we're following certain standards, but we also have to have the backup of a, a, an agency, the government, those people who set up policies to support us in this. The standards are there, but they have to also make sure that we're implementing the standards, we're following them. We're not just put there, oh, follow this and do this, and then right you go, and yeah, find your way. So I think you have to go with that ecosystem 
and um, yeah, make sure that that happens so that your what work you're um, doing is accessible. Okay, so there are some few um, success successes in doing this one. Probably a few years ago, it's very hard to find annual reports that are accessible. All you have are PDFs, and then you have to download them, and then you download them, and if you're using assistive technologies, you cannot even read them. And there's nowhere on the, on the website of where you found that PDF, anything that describes it, not even a line, it's just say download this PDF. But now there are more and more examples where you can see the HTML page at least where it says on the front what it is, but much better, they put the whole report online. So you get the HTML version if you want to use it, or you can get the PDF if you want to download it for whatever purposes you have. Then you download the PDF, and the PDF is accessible. So this is an example from the um, DTA, um, the Digital Transformation Agency website. Of course, they have to make it accessible, because <laughs> uh, that's where we benchmark our work. Um, so, the very difficult part in making um, annual reports accessible is the part, I think, is the financial transactions. Very, very difficult because of the tables. But somehow, we can start to manage putting tables online. And that works with uh, um, assistive technologies as long as you put the header, um, the, the, the header rows, the column um, th that describes whatever the, um, tag the, the rows and the um, so that you can know where you are on the in each cell of the table. Then you download the PDF and the PDF is accessible, such as this one. Another example is this one from the Department of Human Services. What they have is not only the HTML, the PDF, but also the Word. However, their PDF is not tagged, so probably that's why they put the Word document in there. But I think you cannot really have it all. Sometimes you just, you know, have like some balance. There must be some, yeah, um, purpose, uh, like a reason for that one. Well, they have made some, um, another um, special award. Uh, they've, they've got a, a special recognition this year, the Department of Human Services, for not only having um, an accessible website, but also making it accessible as a plain English um, website. So they did got the, um, um, a recognition for being um, getting 88%. Uh, it's a very very tough line to to to, to get through, and they've they've got um, the gold um, recognition from the Plain, Australian Plain English um, Foundation. Sorry. I also I find this is interesting that they put some infographics in in one of their um, pages, and their infographic has the HTML um, description of the infographic. So I don't, it, it's not just so clear, but the middle page in there um, shows the description of the graphic, which is on the other side, um, that shows some infographic of some of their data. They, they've got like a dashboard, and they describe it on their website without even having to download the, the description. So it's all there in the same page. You see the graphic and you will see also the HTML description. Um, our friends from Intopia as well, they, it's probably so difficult to make a description of uh, the WCAG 2.1 map. So what they did was to make an audio file of it. So it's, if you haven't, um, visited that site, and if you haven't listened to the audio file, I encourage you to listen to it. Or if you don't want to listen to it, the person who did that is here. She can make you a live <laughs> reading of it, because she's here. Um, yeah. Um, so you can do that on your time. Um, visit the, the website, and you can see um, how they managed to put a um, file such as transcript and audio file. So, um, where I work at the State Insurance Regulatory Authority, we try to uh, learn also from what's happening around us. So, we're trying to make all our fact sheets and our reports as HTML, although I say it's a work in progress because it's not 100%. It's difficult because you don't have a, a big team dedicated to just doing that. There's so much content you have to publish, you just move, 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 and sometimes you get the PDF right there on the day 
like an hour that has to publish because there's a new um, legislation that come up and there's a report that goes with it and you really have to make sure that you publish in that hour. Um, what I did is um, I also, another half of this um, presentation is that I did a survey among some of the practitioners that I know. So I sent out a link to SurveyMonkey. I wanted to see how other people doing the same work on accessibility, especially for content, um, how do they feel about the work they're doing. Um, I'm hoping that this could be something that we can learn from and something that can influence future decisions in the government. Um, we can, I'll go, um, get through to this one. I'm not sure how we're going with the time because I've got like 10 slides in here. But um, so the, I'm, I'm keeping the survey monkey um, link still open because I want to get as much responses from the Australian um, practitioners. I know that there are a lot of other surveys going on, but they're more geared for the European or the American market. So if you can participate, we'd love to hear your thoughts about um, your practice and we can learn so much from the responses. I've got 15 responses, mostly from the people that I know. So even if they don't share their name, I know who they are. Um, and so you can see the, I'm leaning towards the graphic designers because that's my, my field. So nine of the 15 are, uh, these answers are multiple. So some of them would take like two or three. So nine of them are visual graphic designers, six and uh, write content and manage content for websites and the others do multimedia, digital products, uh, web designer. Um, I forgot what the other one was. Um, I think um, they procure um, for um, their um, company for uh, accessible products. And out of the 15, nine of them work for the government in some way. But those who answered no, because they belong in a private agency, they actually design things for the government. So, yeah. Um, so they said no because they're talking about their own company, but they're actually working a bit for the government as well. Uh, what type of formats do they um, distribute on the website. Most of the people who answer the survey are doing work on PDF. So you can still see that there are a lot of work going on for PDF. Word is the next one. And there's a um, few who answered HTML only, so they don't do other um, formats. And the others are code, HTML, and video. The challenges that they encountered during um, this type of work, um, the biggest one would be the lack of tools and resources available. Eight of the 15 answered lack of tools. The six, uh, seven um, said the work is difficult. Well, it is. If you've been doing that, you would know it's difficult. Um, lack of time. Um, six of the people said uh, there are six responses for lack of time. Um, no training provided, inadequate skills are the next ones. And there are a few who answered, I have not seen any benefits of doing this work, probably because it's geared to why do you have to do this at all? So I, that's my interpretation. Um, I think this survey will still get more value if I get part of it as a narrative because this is just a checklist survey and I'm trying to learn from it. I think I can expand it when I get more story from the people who did the survey. Now the challenges they encountered um, in making the documents accessible, it's they find it difficult to find a complete guide. Creating accessible PDFs is fiddly, time consuming. There's limited tools on Mac and lack of support understanding from clients. Clients can be demanding, but they didn't know how much work is involved. Um, even Acrobat is very clunky and there's very limited information and training for accessibility. And the last bit, uh, I know we're, yeah, I'm, I'm being pressed for time. Um, so the tools, it's um, most of the uh, respondents, 13 of the 15 use um, the checker and the others are, the other tools are available. I'll skip on those details, but I'll be sharing those slides. Um, of course, we're in Australia, we're, we're doing it on the week 2.0, 2.1 2 level double A as a standard for accessibility conformance. So 14 of the 15 answer that, and two also do to a PDF UA, Universal Accessibility Standard. 
um, what will help improve your work and accessibility? 12 of the 15 answered training, a community of practice, software, and tools for fixing issues. I think that's a very good balance because you cannot just solve the problem by just having more tools. I think it's going to be solved by having more community of people that you can bounce um, ideas with and, well, you really have a really very good training. And the others um, that are not on my checklist, but they put in some comments. One person wanted a live instant advice panel where you can call to ask or talk about issues as you need them. How many of you are doing any PDF work and then at the dead of the night, you don't know how to do this? And there's no one to call, no one to ask. You cannot find anything online. There, you can find something online, but they're all conflicting. So. I probably really invite you to get onto that um, SurveyMonkey um, link if you can still add your thoughts about it. Um, you're really welcome and probably have a chance to present to yeah, make, make sure that it makes difference in the future of, for those people who are doing this work and for those people who are using the work that we do. So that's the link and I welcome your thoughts and thank you very much. I, I think you've raised um, a whole topic that's quite a tricky one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I'm actually um, afraid to raise it up because I know yeah. some people are I think you should be. People yeah. will be really cross. Hey, <laughs> why do you still even bother? Unfortunately, yeah. I don't think we've got time for questions, but you're going to be around, aren't you? So yes, people I will am. be able to talk to you. So please take advantage of opportunities during the breaks to talk. You've raised the topic. We've got Greg to follow it on. I think it's been really interesting watching the transition from the printed era to the digital one, and particularly given that probably HTML can be said to have grown out of SGML, which was actually all about printing, wasn't it? Mm. And it's been interesting how, to me anyway, over the last 30 years, I suppose you'd say, uh, oh, to watch what happens and how many people still have to print something to be able to read it. I think that's de decreasing now. But it's been a very strong thing, hasn't it? That you get something on the uh, machine, and then you print it, then you read it on paper. Um, not so good for the trees. So Greg's going to tell us a little bit about how the, the world's sorting itself out at last. Hi, folks. Let's have a little look about the rise of inclusive publishing. There's a few things that have happened. There's been some policy drivers and disruptors that have got in there. So yes, I'm doing a shout out to the, uh, the uh, it's a right to equal access. And I'm talking about equal access first off because really accessibility techniques are part of what we use to provide that equal access. And it's also the language used in the Disability Discrimination Act. It's a right back which we signed up in 2006. It's a legal requirement under the DDA and it's also a legal requirement under the Disability Standards for Education which came out of the DDA. It's now a procurement standard under the Australian standard EN 301549. I know that's got a sexy little number, that one. Accessibility requirements in the procurement of ICT. It's now in the New South Wales ICT services scheme. As I've learnt, even though it's an Australian standard, you then have to get each state to adopt it as a standard. But we're working on that piece by piece. There's been some other disruptors, and that was the Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, not related to the song, for those of you who remember the song. Basically, it was the blind, low vision community absolutely screaming at uh, publishers to make content more accessible. And what we were allowed to do very quickly was it gave us an exception rule to copyright. So that if it wasn't acceptable, um, accessible and we owned a content, yes we could rip it, we could format shift it, we could do things and it scared the bejesus out of the publishers because they started to lose control. So out of that came the Marrakesh Treaty Group here in Australia um, from the Australian publishers. Now even America has joined the Marrakesh Treaty which is quite amazing in itself but we have within our, we're now rebranded as the Australian Inclusive Publishing Initiative and so we've got Groups like the Australian uh, Blindness Forum, Roundtable, 
Royal Society for the Blind Vision Australia, but the publishers are there, the authors are there, the editors are there. Everybody is there together as uh, a collective. And what we've decided as a group, and we made a public initiative last year, is that by 2021, every digital book produced here in Australia will be accessible by default. You'll also see that on screen that our icon is for an EPUB. And that's what it's about. It's about EPUBs, but it's about equal access affording dignity for everybody. We want everybody to have independent access so it doesn't assume that any assistance is required. And these are from the um, Design for Dignity Retail Guidelines that we've got equitable access for everybody. That it doesn't take longer or make you go further. Yes, your content is accessible from the start. That participation and growth is expected normal for all readers, particularly for digital textbooks. And that satisfaction that our, any reader can feel engaged, at ease, safe and connected. And they're our broad design uh, goals, is affording dignity to everybody. As part of that, we looked at PDFs and went, as we've just heard, we all know PDFs, let's be honest, guys. 1983, boom, boom, shake the room, was on the hits parade back in that time. There are certain things that I don't eat, don't drink and don't do that I used to do in 1983 that I don't do now. PDFs are one of those things. Okay? We know that they are not, even if we go through the, the laborious process of making them accessible for a desktop, we know that a lot of that gets stripped out when we put them on a mobile platform. We now live in a mobile and a responsive world. So we don't want them. And just like they are now the ugly stepsister of document types. We really, because we can't shoehorn in any more things to it. And it's time that we let them go. So what's an EPUB? You can see on screen what I've got is a little document type and it looks like it's got a web icon and a zipper because really it's based on the open web platform. It's essentially a zipped little website but instead of having a .zip at the end, it's a .epub as a file format. It means I can unzip it. It means I can play with it. It means just like any other web content, Yes, I can have text, I can have videos, I can have sound, I can have tables, presentations, interactive JavaScript, I can have all sorts of elements within there. And it uses cascading style sheets to give that nice look and feel, and it uses HTML5 to give the structure. Things that a lot of us are all common with and understand. And if I look at this, I can go at the structure here, it has a MIME type. The difference is here between a web page and an EPUB, it has a spine, like a book. It has a navigation system. But it uses MathML, it uses XML, it uses it, a whole range of bits and pieces of normal web technologies. It's just how it's packaged up and how it's distributed. So all of those accessibility guidelines that we use can be applied. All of our good HTML techniques can be used and applied. The difference is, of course, we can have a fixed layout for an EPUB or we can have a reflowable layout. For me, who's blind in one eye and legally blind in the other, I love reflowable ones. Surprise, surprise. Every book is a large print book. And of course, you've got much more control over your fixed layouts. So. Here's an interesting thing. IBM, their default document type now for long publications is EPUB, same with the Japanese government. So if you want to do a really rich layout report, put it in an accessible format, possibly choose fixed layout or potentially a reflowable layout. You choose. But you've got much easier control over something that you're doing rather than going through all the hoops of playing with PDFs. Interestingly, the DAISY Consortium. I love the guys at the DAISY Consortium and the DAISY Readers. I think they must have been involved with uh, 
Game of Thrones because what these guys did, they realised that the DAISY format was a bespoke format and that they were constant battle trying to get accessible content. So what did they do? They joined with the International Digital Publishing Forum and the senior exec of DAISY became the senior exec of the IDPF. And then at the start of last year, the IDPF joined, right? So that means all your major publishers like Macmillan, Harshay, all of those ones, Penguin, the IDPF joined with the W3C. And you started to see the new section in the W3C known as publishing at web. Because the W3C realised that it had let go of part of what was happening with digital publishing and it needed to change. So it's been a marriage of convenience and we're now moving from EPUB 3 on the specs towards EPUB 4. And EPUB 4 is part of what will be known as the packaged web platform, but a little bit more of that later. Here's where you can go. Yes, you can go to the W3C to get some stuff, but one of the best places is the Inclusive Publishing Org. It's international, it's supported by DAISY and a major, all the major publishers. There's great resources there that you can get a hold of for EPUB accessibility checking and also the EPUB accessibility rules, which surprise, surprise, smell and quack, just like WCAG 2.1. So how can I read it? Remember years ago we used to go download um, Acrobat Reader? Well, we're doing food substitution, aren't we? Is it Apple iBooks? Is it Adobe Digital Editions? Kobo? Is it Voice Dream Reader? Kindle, Bluefire, Calibre, Overdrive, Learning Alley? They're just some of the ones that are on the Mac. Or on the PC, we now have um, Microsoft Edge. The browser will open up EPUBs by default. There's a whole range of other different apps that are across there. Some are more accessible than others. But then you also have the Redium plugin for Google. There's a whole range of different apps out there. there are, these are just some of the apps. There's hundreds of them available. Some of them, like iBooks, come default on the device. Same as now on Windows 10, my default EPUB reader is Microsoft Edge. Creating. Yes, we talked about the WCAG guidelines can apply. What are the tools that I can use? Well, there's a stack of them out of there. The first one at the top looks like a little J. It's a, a Scottish company called Juto, J-U-T-O-H. It's about 40 bucks. You can throw a Microsoft Word, you can create and code directly in it, or from a workflow perspective, you can throw a uh, Microsoft Word document at it, and if you've done proper paragraph styles in it, you can say, oh, can you please make me chapters based on heading one? Really nice, very, very easy to use. You've got PubCoder, you've got Book Creator, Calibre, InDesign, now, good old iBooks author, and Apple Pages, so it now means that I can on my iPad or my iPhone create EPUBs. There are other ones, as you can see, right across all the platforms as well. Book Creator is really easy. We've now got kids from kindergarten upwards who are making their own EPUBs. They're just using it as a simple page layout tool. And as you can see from the interface, it's nice and simple. I can add images and text. I can add music to it. I can do all of that. I can even add accessibility descriptions into images. So we teach kids to put accessibility descriptions in because when they're creating books for their classroom, whether it's for their peers or their grandparents, the EPUBs that they create are accessible by default. And in Apple Pages, which is smells and quacks a bit like Microsoft Word, nice simpler interface though, though I do like Microsoft Word, I've got options where I can export it as an EPUB. So really all I've done is learnt the word processor. I'm then choosing, do I want to go into what format? And I can publish directly from there to Apple's bookstore. Or I could do it in Google Docs. 
Download as an EPUB. iBooks author. I can do the same. There's Juto. I can start to see on the top left hand corner the chapter. I can see my text. On the right hand side, I've got the paragraph styles that I can apply. It's also got an inbuilt accessibility checker. Or I could use Pressbooks. Now, Pressbooks is really interesting. It's a, it's a plug in for WordPress. You can get a copy of it. It's, it's a, um, an open file uh, product, so what you can do is download it. It's open source. Pressbooks have their own commercial system, but you can download your own copy of WordPress, of course, and then put in the Pressbooks plugin. And you can have multiple authors coming in through an interface that they understand, but what you're exporting are EPUBs. Little Italian products like EPUB Editor, which is $30 a year, allowing you to create and collaborate on EPUBs. There is a stack of resources out there. The real issue comes down to, like with any good content creation, is thinking about from concept through to completion, how have we built in accessibility from the start? How have we tested it along the way? And as you can see here on the screen interface, here is one that I was working on for the United Nations. And the simple interface, just a simple web interface. Where do you come in? Publishers don't fully understand accessibility. They need help. It's an opportunity. It's something that you should look at because it's something where you can all expand your market. It also means with EPUBs, it's thinking about how you can take and change how you publish long format documents. What are the simple tools? Yes, you're used to going, oh yeah, I'm in Word, I now go make it an ac Acrobat document. Time to do some food substitution techniques. Oh, I've got Juto, right, let's open it up in there, convert it into an EPUB. I can go in there, I can tweak with the code, I can go and look at the style sheet, I can go and play with those. Or I could go into Google Docs, I could open up the Word document in Google Docs, I can do it in Apple Pages. The beauty of it is you can do the base content there and tweak it, or you can have systems like this. It's that simple. But the art of accessibility is something that publishers need, because a lot of their work has been paper-based and as they transition into the digital, it's also transitioning away from PDFs because we know that for a lot of our students with print disability, and print disability is much larger than blind and low vision, it takes in cognitive disabilities such as dyslexia, it takes in learning difficulties, it takes in people whose language is not English here in Australia, it takes in a whole range of different groups we can then use the advantages of a good accessible digital book to give them equal access to the information and the services. Another one is Cotterby. Again, it's about a hundred bucks for a license. And you can flick between a WYSIWYG view, but you can also flick into the code straight away and play with it. They're all things that you can do. What you can do is, and I'm going to give it to the, uh, the group, download, oh, by the way, it's in an EPUB format. Download it, everything that I've talked about here, plus more, is in there. What I can say to people though, from PDFs, remember that the Human Rights Commission has said that if you are relying on, that on a PDF as your main document for, uh, type, that you're more than likely in risk because yes, it's okay to have a PDF inside an intranet if you've got desktop devices, but if you're going out to the public and you're getting them to rely on it, it's not accessible. So if that's the only format that's coming in, you're not providing equal access, you're not providing dignity. Move to EPUBs, thanks.
the things I like about these talks is the way they link in. So your advice to Teresa would be to add EPUB stuff into her survey and her monkey, monkeys will know lots more. Do we have questions for Greg? Hands up. Here we go. You'll have to help me, Lib. Not oh, no, sleep. you'll hear them. Like me, oh, it's dark up there. Hi, Greg. Scott here. Um, Hi, one of the bits of feedback I get a lot is that um, when it comes to creating documents in the office suite, when you try to get them into EPUB, the format never quite seems to be the same. I'm a big fan of EPUBs generally because of their accessibility. Do you have any thoughts on that issue and, and where it might go? I th um, yes, Microsoft uh, I know has got a request in from a lot of people to um, allow us to export directly from Word to EPUB because in the end we know that a, a Word document is, is an ex, has an XML base. Um, it's a matter of gamifying the product request. I will share with everybody what the link is and so the more of us that put that in there the more we will get that. But in the end because if you're using heading 1s, heading 2s, heading 3s and your standard accessibility techniques with alt text and everything else, it's fine. The real issue is Say with Juto, what's great is you can strip out the additional Microsoft code at times that it will put into a, a document, the same in the old days when we used to go from Microsoft Word to straight to HTML. It would put in some redundant code. Um, and then because if it's um, in a good EPUB, it separates um, structure from style, it then means that the reader is going to be able to choose their heading styles. But I think, Scott, the other issue is it depends on whether it's a reflowable one or it's a, a fixed layout one because in the fixed layout you can really um, nail that down to what you want it to be but of course when it's fi uh, reflowable they can choose the font um, style and they can change line spacing and letter spacing now. So the, re the real issue is just doing it as an inline document. If you do it as an inline document for reflowable it'll come up nice and clean and consistent every time. One more quick question. Here we go. Um, so I had one. Hi, Greg. My name's Claire. I work at the Department of Education. Um, we love our PDFs, especially teachers. They love PDFs. Um, I was we were talking to my colleague who does a lot of making PDFs accessible and wringing her hands and wishing we could move to EPUBs. Is there a free tool that does a decent job for? So that so some of the things that we were looking at, there's a licence cost, and we can't say to every teacher in New South Wales, buy this. Is every, every if you, New South Wales Department of Education has Office 365 and it has yep. Google Docs. Yep. Google Docs by default will export to as one of the options EPUBs. Wow. Okay. Great. Thank so, you. So, and for any other teacher, of course, who is on there, who's got a, a Mac and an iPhone or a, a an Apple tablet, Apple Pages, which is, comes for free with the devices, also um, exports to EPUB. Fantastic. Thank well, you Greg, kindly. thank you very much. I'm sorry we haven't got more time, but the fun thing is we've got a chance to talk to you. Are you coming to the dinner on the tomorrow? Got, and uh, I'll be here the next three days. Okay, so you'll be, he'll be here on Saturday, yeah. just in case <laughs> you want to catch up with him. <laughs> Certainly tomorrow and the next day. Um, now Bree's going to come and tell us how the dinner's going to work. Uh, yeah, Sorry. first, hi everyone. Um, those that were speakers today, if you'd like to come down to do a, a group photo, that would be great. And then what we'll do is, uh, those that are coming to the dinner, I'm sorry that it's all booked out, we had to give them certain numbers. Those that booked them this morning, you're okay. Um, it starts at 6.30, so, and it's just a, a, like a five, ten minute walk in Spice Alley. So I'd suggest if you want to go freshen up, go freshen up, meet us there at 6.30, or there's a few of us that are going to go find a drink first. So you're welcome to join us. So, speakers down here. I don't know if I'm on the